So namaste and a very warm welcome to everybody for this second workshop that we are conducting uh, as a partnership between the IKS division and the traditional knowledge uh, digital library division of the CSIR. Uh, we are doing this workshop on the introduction to traditional knowledge, intellectual property and people's rights. And uh, we had a very successful first workshop where people were exposed to these ideas. And now with the fact that we are going on uh, uh, promoting from the IKS division, we are promoting a lot of research in Indian knowledge systems and the traditional knowledge uh, digital library TKDL division itself is doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, we thought it would be really helpful to get more and more people to understand all the complexities that are involved in creating new knowledge in IKS and preserving and protecting existing knowledge traditions. So for these few words, I would like to do a traditional welcome that we do in the IKS division as we start with the shloka, and then I will op I will welcome our uh, team from the TKDL, and then we'll take it forward from there. So. Om Shanno Mitra Shamvarunaha Shanno Bhavatvaryama Shanna Indro Brihaspatehe Shanno Vishnu Rurukramaha Namo Brahmane Namaste Vayo Twameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi Twameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadishyami Rutam Vadishyami Satyam Vadishyami Tanma Mavatu Tad Bhaktara Mavatu Avatu Mam Avatu Bhaktaram Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. So I'm very, very happy and privileged to introduce uh, Dr. Vishwajanani Satyagiri ji, who is the director of the TKDL organization and uh, her team members, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar ji and also Dr. Vijay Lakshmi ji, and uh, we have been working together now for one workshop. We've set up a recent collaboration. Both of them are they're scientists, they're people coming from the law background, so very varied background, but all of us have come together to see how we can preserve our virasat and uh, ensure that our people benefit maximum from these own knowledge traditions. So just with these few very brief words of introduction, a great pleasure again, uh, Vishwajananji ji to have you back with us and Anil ji also. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. Please take this forward. I'll just maybe before you continue, I'll just like to request all our participants. There will be fantastic things that you're going to hear from Vishwajanani ji and the team, but uh, please refrain from putting unnecessary icons, unnecessary chats on the thing because it serves as a distraction. We had this experience in our previous session. And so this time it's a humble request. Kindly don't put anything that is distracting to the central uh, content of the course. Focus on this. We will also require you to have about 80% of attendance in order to get the certification of merit that you will be doing after you do this five hours, along with the assessment that will follow as part of this course content. Uh, please feel free to have active participation. Keep your questions ready. We will see how we will be able to uh, you know, address your questions at the end of every session, which will be typically 45 minutes or so, 45, 50 minutes, and then your questions. If there are any questions that have not been addressed on the one day, we will carry it on to the next day. And But we'll make sure that everybody's questions are answered and uh, the team from TKDL is extremely approachable. So we really want you to uh, engage with this in a very personal manner. So please do so and uh, look forward to your active participation. So with these words, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anirada. It's always a pleasure to be back on this platform talking about traditional knowledge. I think uh, that's a common passion that we both hold uh, <laughs> our divisions. So once again, namaste to all the participants. We are really very glad that you are here today with us to join us on this very important uh, workshop that we believe would be of great value to all of us who share common interests. So the workshop is all about, you know, the uh, intellect, traditional knowledge, the intellectual property rights and the people's rights. So it's a five day program that we have put together. 
So uh, today being the first day, I'll just kind of give you an overview of the expanse and significance. Uh, that is to kind of, you know, reinvigorate our traditional knowledge to kind of understand what is the value that our ancestors have given us and uh, what is it that needs to be done while we take it forward. So uh, basically, this is uh, the second workshop that we are holding between today and the 25th, that is Friday. Uh, the workshop would be between 4 to 5 p.m. It may extend up to 5.30 p.m. I'm sure you would find it interesting to be with us this entire duration of the workshop. Uh, so the way we have, uh, you know, structured the workshop is to kind of, as I said, uh, bring in the common interest together. So as people who have joined to get, uh, today here on this platform would appreciate uh, the traditional knowledge digital library that I belong to is a very unique initiative of the government of India being handled by the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, uh, uh, the TKDL unit under the CSIR and the Department of Indian Systems of Medicine and Homeopathy, which is now the Ministry of Higher. The reason why the TKDL took its birth is owing to the misappropriation of biopiracy of our Indian traditional knowledge. And the TKDL happens to be the first of its kind globally. So that's the kind of pride that we have with the TKDL. As you are all aware, the Indian Knowledge Systems Division is a division under the Ministry of Education. And the core vision of this uh, IKS division is that the Indian perspectives that make this knowledge system globally valuable. So we intend to preserve and disseminate IKS for further research and societal applications. With this uh, in a common interest between the IKS division and the TKDL unit, we have put together this workshop for all of you. So we will be giving you an introduction to the traditional knowledge in the context of intellectual property as well as the people's rights. So the way we have structured the program is that it would be uh, one, one and a half hour every day. Today being the first day, we will give you an overview of the Indian traditional knowledge, the expanse and the significance. Tomorrow will be the fundamentals of intellectual property rights. So what we thought is that before we get into assessing the intellectual property rights of traditional knowledge, let us first understand what is intellectual property rights. So we'll give you specific case studies as well. The third day and the fourth day will be completely focused on only traditional knowledge. On day three, we will be providing you an insight on, you know, what is protection of traditional knowledge. We will be introducing the terms defensive protection, positive protection. We will also be giving you an overview of the TKDL during this time. On uh, day four would be the handling and working with the traditional knowledge, the ethical aspects of it. And the reason why we are introducing the concept of ethics in the context of traditional knowledge is that, you know, when we are talking of oral traditional knowledge that has passed on from one generation to generation, the custodian of this knowledge is the community or the individual. So there are ethical aspects that we need to consider when we are dealing with such knowledge. So the day four will be focused on that. Day five, we will give you a very brief overview of, you know, what is TK inspired innovations, the potential and the road ahead. This is to kind of appreciate what TK can provide you as we move forward with greater R&D and innovation. And in the context of such innovations, how do the intellectual property rights play an important role? So we will be closing the workshop on the day five with the MCQ based test and the details of which you will get to hear as we move forward in the workshop. So the very first thing that, you know, I would like to talk to you today is, as I said, the expanse and significance of our Indian traditional knowledge. As you are all aware, many of you would be knowing it is not just the food that we eat, the medicine that we take, the metallurgy, the architecture, the pottery, the artisan's work like embroidery, textiles, and many more have been passed on to us by our ancestors, which are of value even today. And much of our knowledge, you know, we have had the Guru Sishya Parampara, then there has been knowledge that has been tra transmitted within families or within communities. So there are two ways in which the information has, uh, you know, passed on from generation to generation. One is, of course, as I said, the codified text. The second one would be the oral traditional knowledge. So before we get into the details of that, first I thought, let us understand 
how the ancient systems of education worked in India. This is to appreciate that whatever we have done has gone with certain kind of rational and as well as logic behind it. So the very first thing that I would like to introduce to you is the way you know education was given in ancient India. So the two major things that I'd like to bring to your purview is the Tarka Vidya and the Vada Vidya. So ever since you know that uh, our education has got codified, we've been hearing about you know this uh, science and art of logic and debate. So the reason why I would like to introduce you is to again re-emphasize that our traditional knowledge is linked to logic. It is linked to rational and of the time. Okay, so perhaps that rational and logic would be relevant today or it may have changed. So for that reason, we also need to look into the art of discussion that is a Vada Vidya, which should be of relevance in reposting our traditional knowledge to the needs of the time. So here, besides the Tarka Vidya and the Vada Vidya, there is one thing that we need to also understand is that there are certain terminologies that I'd like to introduce from our ancient systems of education. That is sadhya, that is the thesis which is to be established. It could be a hypothesis as well. Siddhanta is a proposition or it could be a tenet or a conclusion. Siddhanta becomes again very important in the way we handle our traditional knowledge. Often I'm repeating the word logic and reasoning. So Tarkavidya, as I mentioned, is a science of art and logic, art of logic and debate. Ketu is the reasoning. And the reasoning goes with Mudharana, that is examples. There could be an affirmative example that is Sadharmaya or the negative example by Dharmya. So in all of this, there are very important aspects of perception that is Pratyaksha, Anumana, inference, and Pramana, the proof. So in, in today's context, everything we say should be evidence based and uh, this Ramana has had its own importance even in the ancient times. There are three kinds of debate that has been, you know, uh, recommended in the Nyaya Sutra that is Katha, literal speech. Here is, uh, here in, in the Katha, it is the thesis and the counter thesis, which is argued by protagonist based on evidence and argument. The second very important aspect of debate is jalpa, which entails equivocation, that is ambiguous language and false reasoning to kind of put your counterpart away from the actual thought process that you have. The last but very important thing is the vithanda. The vithanda vadya is basically characterized by absence of a counter thesis. Again, I repeat the reason why I'm bringing all this to your purview is to say that much of whatever we have inherited today has gone through a lot of this reasoning, the logic, and as well as the, you know, the uh, uh, pramana to say that, you know, this existed at some point of time for a particular reason, which would be relevant at that appropriate time. And the same knowledge can be relevant today if the conditions happen to be the same, or we need to kind of repose it to meet the needs of the current times. So while we are talking of all of this, I would also like to mention that it is not just today that we are talking of, you know, the different aspects of uh, education in terms of, you know, super specializations. Even in the Jataka tales, they have been four, 64 colors, that is art and crafts that have been taught to students. The subjects could include music, dance, culture, metallurgy, agricultural sciences, ship building, rope making, and many more. But that they have been prevalent even in our ancient times speaks about the volume of the significance and the expanse of our traditional knowledge. Here on this particular slide, continuing with the ancient systems of education, what I'd like to draw to your purview is that I talked about Pramana, that is the proof. So there is a Nyaya Pramana Shastra that is the science of correct knowledge. And what does it entail? Four conditions. One is the subject that is Pramatra, object Prameya, which is the process of cognition to which it is directed. Cognition or the Pramiti itself, the nature of the knowledge or the Pramana. So the Pramana can be either proof or nature of knowledge. And these are the four pillars on which the Nyaya Shastra realized, that is the science of correct knowledge. 
And uh, there are four pramanas that are uh, recommended for acquiring correct knowledge. One is pratyaksha, that is direct perception. Anumana, that is inference. Upamana or analogy, that is by example. Or shabda or verbal testimony. Again, you know, I would like to mention that, you know, the logic, the reasoning, the perception, the analogy, the verbal testimony have all been the pillars of which our ancient knowledge has been developed. And that's the reason we need to go back and then give it, give the traditional knowledge the value it actually deserves so it can be relevant today in the contemporary times. For people who are joined, these from the, um, uh, you know, Ayush uh, domains would understand even Charaka Samheta, the use of logic in medicine has been emphasized enough. It is not merely by saying that, you know, a particular medicine is available and it can be used. The reason why that particular medicine is used for a particular condition is also mentioned in the Samheta. Similarly, Shushruta Samhita talks about the interdisciplinary approach. What does the Shushruta Samhita say? That a physician who has learned one science alone cannot be sure of his science. And here he means about the Ayurveda. And here the reason, I mean, he says it is for this reason the physician has to be versed in many sciences. So since our ancient times, we have been also talking about the interdisciplinary approach. So with this background and the importance of, you know, logic and reasoning being the key pillars of our ancient knowledge, I'd like to mention that as we move with time, things change, you know, with evolution of time, many other developments happen and we moved on. Today, if we are talking about <laughs> academic fields, they are innumerable number of fields. I just kind of give you an example of, you know, uh, the major uh, ones, the natural sciences, which include biology, chemistry, earth sciences, physics, astronomy, humanities, and social sciences are so many. It could cover anthropology, archaeology, geography, political science, and many more. The formal sciences are, you know, the more recent ones besides the mathematics, of course, the computer sciences, the logics, and the system science. And all of this put together in various different forums can lead to professions and applied sciences. So with this background, you know, while we are talking about super specializations, we are also talking about interdisciplinarity and as well as transdisciplinarity. So that is what uh, uh, is very important as we move forward in uh, the way we appreciate and integrate ancient knowledge with the contemporary sciences and as well as education. All of you, as I mentioned, you know, you might have heard about Charaka Samhita, you would have heard about Shushruta Samhita, uh, uh, Shushrita, for, you know, uh, being the first physician who was, you know, very renowned for surgical, uh, as, uh, for surgical methods. So I'd like to give you an example of one more such physician, Jivaka, who happens to be the physician to Lord Buddha himself. And he, Jivaka is known, very well known for Ayurveda. I believe he was the first one who had prescribed nasya for headaches uh, for a patient who has been having such a long, prolonged headache for over seven months. <laughs> he also treated King Bimbisara for bleeding hemorrhoids, uh, you know, in the fistula by just putting medicine under the nails and providing medicated ointments. Jivaka is also known for, you know, his uh, expertise in brain surgery. As the story goes, there has been a, a businessman who, uh, probably the businessman or his wife, who had been having severe headache for many, many months. And it, it, no matter what treatment was given, they were not, the person was not cured. So he happens to be the person who identified there's a problem in the brain and he cut open the brain and then removed two large ones from the brain and then closed it back again with medication and that cured the particular person from, you know, the repeated headaches she has been having. Jeevata also happens to have cured King Pradyod for uh, the pernicious anemia by giving the, you know, kashaya rasa with ghee. And not only that, he treated Lord Buddha himself for blocked intestines. And uh, here, considering the frail, uh, uh, frailness of Lord Buddha, he appears to have given 19 rounds of mild purgation and given a handful of lotuses to inhale. 
the essence from the emanate from the flowers themselves. Jivaka is also known for one very other important aspect. Until then, all the bush, this monks will collect rags from the cemeteries. And he was the first person who went and told Lord Buddha to not allow the monks to wear clothes that have been you know, dumped at the cemeteries. It is a, a health hazard. And listening to him, Lord Buddha advised his monks that they could accept any uh, you know, gift of cloth given by any uh, you know, person disciple or, uh, or devotee. And they did not wear the clothes that had been dumped at the cemeteries. So there was a concept of hygiene that was introduced by Jivaka himself. So there are many such physicians known in Ayurveda, which we are all not aware of, uh, our own traditions and uh, our heritage. The reason again why I'm trying to bring all this to your purview is to kind of, you know, bring in a sense of, you know, how vast and how diverse our uh, heritage has been. And we need to go appreciate it for the very reason that the, it was valued at some appropriate time and it may still have relevance in today's context. Again, coming from Ayurveda, uh, Ayurveda is known for, you know, multiple aspects of of uh, you know treating diseases as well as health and wellness. Just giving you one example of amla, okay. And uh, in fact, uh, we all have heard about the English saying, you know, uh, uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I think an equivalent of uh, apple in Ayurveda is the amla. Uh, this is known to balance with ridusha, the vata, pitta, and kapha. Amla is used both as a you know fresh fruit pulp as well as a dried fruit pulp, and uh, depending on you know the different kind of uh, you know the formulations, the amla has been known for varied uh, uh, indications. It is uh, known as an antioxidant. It is known as an anti-inflammatory. It is known as an immunity enhancer. It is known as a rejuvenating uh, tonic. It is known for its anti-diabetes properties. It improves eyesight. It maintains good hair and skin health, among various other aspects. And these are all listed in our codified text with the I mean, evidence of that particular tribe. Similarly, if I talk about one indication, vitiligo, okay, if you look at Ayurveda, there are so many different formulations, medications available for treating vitiligo, which is a skin disorder. So what happens in vitiligo is the, lo the uh, loss of melanocytes leads to the patches of skin. Sometimes it is considered a social stigma also, and uh, uh, no, uh, there is no effective treatment in the modern medicine. Whereas when you look at our own traditional systems of medicine, just look at the, the, in, the slide. It is filled with, you know, the, uh, uh, medications, therapeutic options that are available to treating vitiligo. Ayurveda, as I said, has so many different uh, decoctions and as well as other formulations that are known for treating vitiligo. Similarly, is the case with homeopathy. Yunani, again, has effective treatments for uh, vitiligo. Siddha also has effective treatments for vitiligo. In all of this, you know, yoga therapy and other uh, traditional methods such as red clays and other, you know, even powdered radish seeds have been used by local health traditions for treating vitiligo. So this is kind of giving you an expanse of our traditional knowledge. All of you have heard about Ayurveda. Some of you might have also heard about Pashu Ayurveda, Vriksha Ayurveda and all that. Again, I want to introduce one another Ayurveda terminology, which I also learned very recently. That is the Pushpa Ayurveda. Just by, you know, having, uh, you know, flowers, Pushpa Ayurveda is based on flowers. And this particular Pushpa Ayurveda seems to have reference in Kalyana Karaka, uh, Ayurvedic treatise by Ugraditya Acharya, a Jain physician of the 9th century. I believe he has taken reference from a very old Karnataka script of about, you know, th uh, 300 BC or something like that, which provides a preparation of Rasayana medicines with 18,000 kinds of flowers. So the Pushpa Ayurveda, as per this uh, Jain physician, uh, covers darshana, that is by gazing at a flower, there is a kind of a treatment that is available. I think in today's context, you might have all heard about, you know, those, uh, uh, what is the, the fragrance therapies that are being used by many in the, in the wellness centers. 
So this is one another way of treating uh, uh, diseases, uh, health conditions. So in Rakta Mandara, that is Hydriscus rosa, it is used for the treatment of Vataroga joint pains. It is just by looking at the flower, you know, the red hibiscus. The Aragvada, which is a Cassia fistula rose, it is a yellow flower. It is useful by gazing at us. It helps in constipation, relieving constipation. The Arum marigold and the Antinus nobilis, they are all different flowers, you know, of different colors are all used for a particular health condition. Then you have Sparsha Vidhanam. Sparsha Vidhanam is about, you know, advising the patients to wear or touch the particular flowers so that there is an effect of the flower on the patient. So here one can use a garment of flowers. It can, you can put it on bracelets, necklace, or sometimes they ask you to lie on a bed made of flowers. So this is the Sparsha Vidhanam under the Pushpa Ayurveda. You then have the Alepana Vidhanam, which is the flowers singly or mixed in with some other medicated drugs are ground into a pulp and then applied on the body or a particular part of the body. So this is the Alepana Vidhanam. Then you have Agrana Vidhanam or Nasi Vidhanam, basically the smelling or the nasal drops. And depending on the fragrance, you can have mild, medium or uh, the very high, the Thibra Vidhanam. Sometimes it is also the nirganda that is the odorless uh, uh, therapy. In addition to that, the Kalyanaka Karaka also mentions about the Ashwadhana Vidhanam. It is all about, you know, consuming plants by eating or drinking, depending on, you know, whether it is a rasa, that is a fresh extract, or it is a kvata, a, a decoction, arka, distillation, sometimes thaila is made, grikha with ghee. So the Pushpa Ayurveda is also a part of you know, uh, the Ayurveda, which is completely focused only on the flowers. Our traditional text also talks about traditional perfumery. I think many of us, you know, especially I coming from a modern science background, I've only heard about the French uh, perfumery which is very well known across the world. And I'm sure I would have many participants who would agree with me that, you know, we have only heard about the French perfumes. Way back in the ancient texts of Rehat Samhita, there have been, you know, traditional methods of making perfumery, which is the Ghanda Yukti. So uh, in the Shroka 10, he, the uh, uh, Brihat Samhita ta talks about, you know, using different formulations of different uh, 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 ingredients to make a perfume. So here in the Shloka 10, uh, it talks about Haritaki, it talks about Shanka, it talks about Dhana, it talks about Drava, it talks about Ambu, Ruda, Ukpala, Shailaka, as well as Musta to give a perfume. And not just that, you know, it gives you the ingredients, it also tells about how do you mix everything. So it says, you know, you can take any of these nine substances and uh, no mixture can contain the same number of parts of any two substances. So that is the link that they have given to that perfumery, the magic code, I would say. And then you can uh, you know what you then do is that you mix all the nine ingredients and uh, by this you also can understand how many combinations, permutations and combinations you can make. So if you go by that, you know, and by saying that each substance can be taken from one to nine parts and no two substances shall be taken in the same number of parts, the number of mixtures by which, you know, you can arrive at perfumes by putting all together is one into two into three into four, so on into nine. It gives you three lakh sixty two thousand eight hundred and eighty different varieties of perfumes using those nine ingredients that have been mentioned on this particular slide. You, the Brihat Savita also talks about the ocean of perfumes. It is the Ghandhat Manava, the traditional perfumery. Here what they have advised is, you know, you can go for 16 substances and if every four of them are permuted variously at will and that in one, two, three or four parts, okay, you will be able to arrive at 1,74,702 different kinds of perfumes. So they have also mentioned what are the ingredients, Dhana, Ushira, Aguru, Dhanya, Valaka, Naga Pushpa, Madanaka, Garchura, Saileya, Vyagra, Nakha, Chola, Garpura, Sprikata, Gara, Malaya. 
So in the shlokas itself, they have also mentioned, say, uh, for example, if you're talking of karpura, which is very volatile, they have asked you to add those ingredients only at the end so that you do not lose the uh, ingredient while making the perfume. So this is the extent where which it is not only in terms of the expanse, it, even in terms of the depth, the ancient text has given us so much of information that we can use it either for further R&D or innovation, or sometimes even we can make perfumes and use it uh, for commercial purposes. But we need to ensure that we have the right expert to guide us in this entire process. When we are talking of plants, it becomes incomplete if we do not touch upon the traditional agricultural practices. Similar to the systems of medicine where I touched about uh, Sharaka Samhita, Shusharaka Samhita and many other books, even in traditional agriculture, you have focused books, be it Krishi Parashara, Arthya Shastra also talks about Brihat Samhita, Patanjali Mahabhasha, then you have Kashyapa Krishi Shukti, Surapala's Briksha Ayurveda, and uh, also Lokopakara, many other books. Parashara clearly mentions Sustha Bhavanti Krishaka Dhanadhanya Samhimpaha. May the farmers be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And that is the context in which we are also talking about farmers, you know, uh, happy, leading a healthy life so that we also are healthy because of them. The ICAR, that is the Indian Council for Agricultural Research, has made an inventory of not just what are the practices that have been mentioned in our text, but also in terms of the practices that are carried out by the local communities, the farmers themselves. There are seven volumes of such book, and some of them have also been validated by the uh, uh, ICAR. For example, uh, you know, in uh, the last book, they have given a summary of 38 validated Indian knowledge uh, system traditions in agriculture, out of which 23 have been validated in multi locations, whereas 15 have been single center experiments. To kind of give you an example as to what our ancient agricultural practices contain, you might have heard about you know organic farming and that India has been known for organic farming since ancient times. That is all true, but you know our ancient texts go beyond that. For example, you know, for improving seed germination, they had talked about, you know, seeds with a hard pericap, the seeds which are very hard to germinate. So there are methods for helping, you know, such seeds for germination. For example, in this Brihat Briksha Ayurveda, uh, there is a reference to tamarind or any other seed having a hard pericap. How can it uh, germinate? They say, you know, you put it in water, mix it with powder of trifala, that is terminalia chebula, terminalia bellirica, and as well as uh, philanthus and bellica. You can also add, uh, I mean, you add uh, uh, sesame also, barley, black gram, and then soak it well with turmeric, and you use this so that the uh, seeds germinate. So it's all about softening the pericarp and help the seed germinate. Ancient times, you know, again, an uh, example from Brihat Samhita, it talks about grafting. To me, again, coming from the modern science and technology, I thought grafting is more of a modern, you know, intervention that has been generated only after the modern science came into picture. If you go back to the Shloka 7, the Brihat Samhita says about transportation of uh, uh, a plant to other countries, they say, the trees can be taken to other countries and they grafted on others. If you have smeared from root to the stem with ghee and a pagon, sesame, honey, vidanga, milk, and kauda. So this is again to talk about the expanse and as well as the depth of our traditional knowledge. As I said, our traditional knowledge is not confined to only the information that has been codified that's available in the text. There's a lot of oral traditional knowledge also available in the country. Here is one particular example. There is a particular group of you know, farmers uh, in the Navapada district of Orissa, uh, and uh, they deal with the foot and, mouth, the foot and mouth disease in cattle. And how do they do that? They use a mixture of Harida and Behada powder and uh, use this particular uh, uh, you know, combination after boiling it, they apply it on the animals twice a day. So using this particular ITK, uh, the uh, Department of Veterinary Medicine 
uh, under the West Bengal University of Animal and Fishery Sciences, Kolkata, as and as well as the uh, Kalahandi uh, KVK Kalahandi Bhavani Patna work together. What I did is a proper study. They took five groups of cows. Okay. One is the untreated control. The second one is this particular ITK, which belonged to the farmers of the Navapada district, which contains Harida and Bahida. And then there was a second, third group, which had used a Karala tree. The paste of the root box of the Karala tree was used twice daily. Then you had a fourth group, which had cows, which were treated with neem oil. And the last group was the conventional treatment of the modern intervention, the Baxivate, 2.5 gram was given daily for three days. Based on this entire study, the group, the investigators came to the conclusion that this particular ITK was found to be effective in controlling the foot and mouth disease in the cattle, both cows and buffaloes. Why they took five to six days for the animals to recover by using this treatment? The conventional medicine provided four to five days of treatment, I mean, recovery period. So it is just a matter of one to two days difference. But in, when you talk about the cost effectiveness of it, the ITK was found to be much more cost effective than the conventional treatment. So this kind of highlights that, you know, by doing a proper experiment, you are able to even validate the local traditions that are being followed by the concern groups. It could be farmers, it could be healthcare workers and others as well. One another example, again, from the field of agriculture, especially on an animal husbandry. Uh, many of you might have heard about this Lantana camera plant, which is a perennial shrub, and it is a highly invasive species, especially in the Himachal Pradesh. The problem with the lantana is that it leads to toxicity. When the animals graze it by eating the leaves, it leads to you know, po uh, uh, poisoning. It can lead to skin disease, photosensitization, constipation, etc. So the local interventions that I have widely used in the Himachal is that they drench the animals with sar lassi, or sometimes they give the sar, along with sar lassi, they add mustard oil and uh, even arm lamb. Sometimes they use a lantana root for curing the uh, poisoning of the lantana leaves. Sometimes they cut the ear off so that the uh, animal bleeds and the poison is then removed. So these are all the local traditions which are still prevalent. Agriculture does not get complete if we don't touch up the water. Uh, this is only to give you a very, uh, uh, you know, a brief example of, you know, how water was conserved in our ancient times. So basically, basically our traditional practices covered conservation by collecting rainwater and flood waters. Okay? Appropriate structures and methods were created and everything depended on the climate, the rainfall, the geographical region, what are the local materials available, the soil and others. You might have heard about the Mohanjadaro, which had a you know, proper system of storing water. If you go to the Northeast, you would see, uh, see a lot of bamboo based, uh, you know, uh, interventions that help in water conservation, including the bamboo drip irrigation. The step wells, India has been known for the step wells from across, you know, different parts of Rajasthan, even Delhi, you have one, and of course, uh, Gujarat. So these are all, you know, the different kinds of water conservation methods. And in fact, the, the uh, reference that I have given you by the Terry Poly Center, it provides you all the traditional methods of water conservation by the region. It could be Trans Himalayan, Western Himalayas, Eastern Himalayas, the coastal regions, the highlands, the desert regions. And it's a wonderful article that has been put together by this particular study group. Talking of agriculture, of course, the first thing that we talk about that comes to our mind is about food and nutrition. Similarly to that of, you know, so the systems of medicine or agriculture, there are a lot of books that are focused on traditional food and, uh, you know, nutrition. So, for example, you have the Pakadarpanam by Maharaja Nala himself, Super Shastra by Mangarasa, Bojana Kutuhala by Raghunatha Ganesha, Shema Kutuhala by Shema Sarma, 
Shiva Thakur, Ratna Karabai, Basavaraja. These are only few of the books. For example, if I talk of Shema Kutuhala, okay, it is a book on the dietetic extent as well as the culinary art. And look at all the information that is available in the book. You talk, there are 12 chapters in that book, and each of the chapter, it talks about, you know, it's called the Utsavas. The first one is focused on seven times of Dravya Pakas. The second one is on the utensils. The third one talks about the qualities of the physician and cook. Please note it. It's not just about the cook. The physician is also involved in identifying what needs to be eaten and when. It talks about the seasons and the routines to follow. For a daily routine, what is prescribed? It talks about the non-vegetarian food, the meat-based foods, cooking of fish. In the chapter eight, the eighth tooth survives about the different types of vegetables. The ninth is about the different preparations from different plants. Then you have cooked foodstuffs, then you have appetizers and other products, including the dairy products. So that is the vastness of our this one. Uh, our uh, traditional knowledge. Talking of Pakadarpanam, which is by none other than uh, King Nala, here he talks about soup, preparation of soup. What is soup? It is dal. So here he talks about kurati, urad dal, batwas, arhar, and uh, chana. Uh, everything is mixed and uh, you know uh, properly cleaned, and then you make the soup out of it. Okay, and he adds about the ingredients that can add to the taste, including hing and other things. And here I'd like to read, uh, read the last one. If he says, Iske baad thal chul se achhi tarah mat kar jal mila de. Tadantar kharpur tata vibhinna sugandho pushpon se achhi tarah swasit gandit kar le. इस प्रकार मेरा बनाया हुआ उत्तम स्वादिष्ट दाल पाचक राजा के लिए दे दे। So this is meant for you know food that is fit enough for a raja and that is available for every common public today. So we can also you know emulate and use this uh, uh, dal for better health and nutrition. Similarly, there is one more. Uh, uh, he has mentioned, so as I mentioned, our food was not only meant for, you know, uh, meeting the uh, the taste flavors of our tongue, of our body. It was also meant for, you know, better health as well. So here is one another example of the Krishna Kuruti's Banani Ka Vedi Tata Gun. So this particular pachak from <coughs> Dal from Krishna Kuruti, he talks about pepper, lesson, hing, and other ingredients, I'm sorry. And uh, this particular uh, uh, preparation is known to have, uh, you know, if, uh, 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 elevation of bath vikar and as well as cup vikar. And it says it helps you to overcome the diseases related to the bath rogues. <laughs> When we are talking of food, utensils become important. So here is a slide that talks about how utensils were used uh, way back in our ancient times. Of course, many of us are aware that the early cooking was all largely based on clay pots or then later on, you know, <clears throat> made of uh, stones, the stone bits. Uh, but over time, we moved into the Iron Age, the Copper Age, the Bronze, and the Brass, and we started using vessels of made of various metals. Over time, our food habits also changed. Earlier, a lot of our food habits were based on, you know, using local resources. We had the concept of, you know, protecting environment and ecology, and that is a way uh, our everyday behavior was. But of course, with time, things changed. Today we feel that using a plate is much more economical because you can use, you know, water, you can wash it and then reuse it. Okay. But then if you look at, you know, the way our ancient, uh, you know, traditions have been, every particular leaf that has been used for eating food on has a particular uh, reasoning associated with it. It has an application as well. If you talk of plantain leaf, of course, it is known to be a cordial uh, indication for using a plantain leaf when you are, especially in the South India. But I believe 
It is also known to stimulate the digestive fire use and it is useful when you're tired and, and also when you have gout. Similarly, if you're talking of the butea monospera, that is the palash leaf, it alleviates the vata and kapha, and it also treats the parasitical uh, uh, diseases such as ascites and abdominal tumor. It also cures the dyspnea. You take the castor bean leaf, it alleviates vata and kapha, it kills worms, it treats fever, and it is beneficial for rising digestion. And I would like to draw your attention of this particular slide to the reference that I had given. This is more of a recent reference. You know, it is about the journal information from the Journal of Ethnic Foods <laughs> of 2018. The reason why I'm drawing reference to also the recent, uh, you know, uh, the publication is that our traditional knowledge as a you know person who is trying to do modern science and technology may not always refer only the ancient text some of the ancient texts may not be available also but it is good to understand what is already available as prior art until today okay and then see what is it that we can do to further r and d innovate and use it in our everyday life especially in consideration of the unmet needs that we have today so I did talk about, you know, you, uh, the Iron Age, the Copper Age, the Bronze, the Brass and others. And uh, India has known for its profit, <coughs> proficiency in metallurgy and allied areas. I will give you an example of uh, the wood steel in the interest of time, only one example. Uh, so this wood steel in today's context, all of us are talking about these high grade, ultra high carbon steel, uh, which is supposed to be of, you know, high relevance and uh, utility today. This wood steel that we are talking about that existed many, many thousands of years ago, especially in the South India, the Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and uh, Andhra region. This particular wood steel was made out of porous iron, and it is a very detailed process by which the wood steel is made. It is first that uh, first you, you prepare the porous iron, you hammer it while it is hot to release the slag. Then you break it up, you add some wood chips in a clay container, and you heat it. Okay, until all the wood is uh, uh, you know burnt, heated, and then it is absorbed in the iron and then again melted. So the steel that has been formed by this entire process is known to have a uniform composition of 1 to 1.6 carbon. And this is the high grade high, uh, high carbon steel that we are talking about. And this particular wood steel has been used even for the very famous Damascus swords. And uh, people who are aware of the Damascus sword, uh, this particular sword was uh, used, uh, you know, now, for not only cutting the heads off, but also for cutting wood, and as well as a sil silk scarf with equalities. And that is the you know, proficiency that India had way back in our ancient times, even in the domain of metallurgy. There are books, unlike the, you know, the systems of medicine and as well as the uh, agriculture and other areas that I mentioned, there are no you know, specific books only on metallurgy. Of course, you have the Rasaratna Kara, which is more into the Rasayanas and other things. But specifically on metallurgy, you would only find references. It could be the Agama Shastra or it could be the Shilpa Shastras and all that. But there is in, the information is very disparate and needs to be gathered. So again, another example of the metal alloys. Uh, here we are talking of the iron mirror, uh, mirror. This is a metal mirror. There is no glass used. And what does it contain? It contains tin, it contains zinc, it contains phosphorus, it contains iron, it contains nickel and copper, no glass at all. And iron mirror, mirror is still being made by a very small group of artisans in Kerala. There is one another example of the Kadavalur eating bowl. And uh, this is, you know, again made by a repeated thermomechanical process. It contains tin, it contains lead, it contains zinc, it contains phosphorus to a small amount, and the rest is all copper. 
So these are all the traditions, the metal laws that have not been prepared today, but in ancient India, and they're still relevant today and they're still prevalent today, although to a very small extent. So this is to kind of again give you an overview of how uh, diverse, how uh, you know vast our traditional knowledge has been and is of relevance even today. When we are talking of the architecture of India, it's a living tradition because if you go to any of the old temples, you would see how beautiful the architecture is. I'll give you just one example of the Tanjavur Pradeshwara temple. So here, you know, it is uh, the IGNC says it is an artistic excellence because it the excellence lies in the perfect balance of the parts and the whole. The architecture, the sculpture, the painting, the stone and the bronze images, the idols within and the reliefs without. The inscriptions on the wall of the temple provide a vast purpose of information at the level of economic, social, cultural, organizational, and administrative patterns and structures. So that is the information content of our temples. It's not just for the religious purpose, spiritual purposes that we go there, but it contains so much information that would be of relevance even today. There's so much that we can learn from such architectural marvels of India. So to kind of give you, you know, further information on the Brady Shara Temple, there's a multimedia DVD made by the IGNCA and uh, it, uh, you know, and it's a very useful uh, information because, you know, you can move your mouse over the temple and you will get information on each of the part of the architecture as well as the information on the carvings and the sculptures. So here for one example I'd like to give. It is about the linga that they talk. Then they talk about the sculptures on the ground and the upper floors. And then they move to the upper floor, the central sanctum. They provide you information on all the sculptures. Particularly, I would like to draw info, uh, your attention to the <coughs> dance karanas described in the Bhartanatya Shastra. And then it happens to be the magic number in most of our ancient texts. And so is the case even with the Natya Shastra. In the temple on the first floor, there were 108 stone blocks that they left to be carved, but the work was stopped after the 81st dance. So 81 dance karanas are depicted in the Vredeshwara temple. So it is not only information on the architecture, but also in terms of the cultures, the cultural expressions that prevailed during the period was also captured in such, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, temples. Talking of continuing with architecture and infrastructure, uh, we talked about a huge and magnificent Pradeshara temple. I would like to go to the Spiti Valley now with you to the Himachal Pradesh, where if you look at the picture, it appears to be a very, very simple monastery, doesn't it? And this Tabo Mud Monastery <laughs> is, was made in the 10th century. And despite the, you know, very uh, difficult weather terrain, uh, it has survived over all these years. This particular monastery has been made of cork, which includes raw earth, water, and fibrous materials like the straw. And not only that, it is all about the architecture and the infrastructure. If you go inside the monastery, even now you would see some collection of frescoes, that is mural paintings and the tankas, the scroll paintings adorning the walls of the monastery. And uh, this is also called the Ajanta of the Himalayas. While these are all, you know, kind of associated with some kind of religion and as well as our promotional sentiment, I'd also like to draw about the simple structures that have been built by uh, the uh, communities. Here, I would like to give you an example of the bungas. Okay, and uh, the bungas are circular structures made out of mud bricks, and the interior is made of the tree branches, again packed with mud. So you might have all heard about uh, the Bhuj earthquake, right, in 2001. So in terms of the rehabilitation and uh, uh, rebuilding the Bhuj, the Bungas were created. And uh, it, for every family, two Bungas were created. They built about 1,400 houses uh, after the earthquake. Similarly, when the Kosi floods happened in Bihar in 2008, 
the Bungas again came off years because two model villages of 15,000 houses were built and uh, the policy that facilitated about black houses. So this is the relevance of our traditions, our culture, our cultural expressions when we are talking about the expanse and significance. It's not just important that we talk about only the scientific interventions because our traditional knowledge can be uh, very disparate and it can be very diverse as well. Of course, we have 22 languages that have been formally, uh, 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 for, uh, that has been formalized by the government of India. But then India ha is home to so many, many languages. And as per an article in Indian Express in 2020, there are about 600 potentially endangered languages in India. And as the author rightly says, with each dead language, we are losing out on a culture system. So the Ministry of Tribal Affairs took cognizance of it. And they have identified 82 language primers that needs to be protected and promoted. So the slide gives you, you know, different uh, kind of language primers across different states. In Tripura, there are 14. In uh, Orissa, there are 5. Maharashtra, 11. Madhya Pradesh, 15. And it also talks about the language and the tribes that would be covered under this particular initiative from the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Similarly, cultural expressions include the different art forms and uh, there are uh, about 52 incredible Indian art forms that says uh, that the author says here that we must protect in, <coughs> as part of our cultural expressions. And uh, right from the Ipan art, the Assam is media painting to Patachitra or the Pipli art, there are so many of our Indian arts that still has value today and needs to be given, handed over to our future generations as well. Cultural expressions, it is not just for the, you know, the a feeling of happiness that you know we uh, look at it, but when we are talking of the traditional cultural expressions, that is the performing art, it's not only has been, as I said, a means of entertainment, but it is also a means of communicating from a social perspective, from as well as the human rights perspective and other things. For example, if you are talking of the Yakshagana from Karnataka, this is a very effective folk theater form that has been used extensively for conveying environmental consciousness. So here is a particular example from Karnataka. As you all know, Bharatanatyam, you know, has been, I even gave you the Natya Shastra example from the Brihadishwara temple. This particular Bharatanatyam has been a reflection of the past evolving embodiment, but more importantly, it has been used extensively to cover societal themes. It could be women empowerment, it could be human rights uh, uh, issues related or even improving literacy and as well as you know, other uh, social aspects. It has been used extensively. Music is a tool which has been found effective as a therapeutic tool for various, you know, human ailments, you know, especially the mental disorders. So they have been all scientifically validated as well. To summarize, I'd like to say that I just tried to give you an overview. I think I exceeded time. Nevertheless, I'm sure you would have patience to continue for a few more minutes with me. I would like to say our Indian tradition is so vast and diverse. It needs appreciation as well as rejuvenation. And I'm sure you would join hands with me in promoting this sentiment of mine and as well as the government of India. So here when you're talking of traditional knowledge, there are two major forms. One is the codified and the non-codified. The codified typically covers the manuscripts, scriptures, painting, texts, and other things. So Non-codified as the oral traditional knowledge that has been passed on from generations to generations. As I said, Guru Sishya Parampara has been a primary mode of education, but education has been received within families and communities as well as an oral knowledge. And uh, you know, the logic, reasoning, and debate are very important for our you know education, and that forms the uh, you know the basis on which India has grown over thousands of years and would still be relevant even in today's con uh, today's uh, context. The sadhya, the siddhanta, the hetu, the udharana, sadharnya, vaidharmya are all very important. Not to forget that the Tarkavidya and Vadavidya are essential even in today's context because 
people, we need to understand why we are doing what we are doing, and we need to have the relevant reasoning and background information for that. The four pramanas for acquiring correct knowledge include pratyaksha, anumana, upamana, and shabda. And I'm sure you would also appreciate that. While we are talking of traditional knowledge, while we need to feel very proud about it, we also need to move forward with evolution of time. And what is required is the pramana of our times. And that is why we are here today, the CSAR, TKDL, and the IKS division, to bring to you that the national IPR policy and the national education policy, both in terms of innovation and as well as education, clearly mentions that you know the importance of our knowledge systems that is the indian knowledge systems and why it is important to use this as a foundation as we move forward so our role is for protecting preserving and protecting uh, promoting our traditional systems of knowledge from india thank you so much for your patient listening namaste vishwajaniji thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring presentation. It's the second time I'm getting to hear it, but there is so much to pay attention to and to learn every time. Um, and For I me think, too. <laughs> no, <laughs> just to be aware of this vast spread of detailed study that has been done. I think that is what is so inspiring and how ignorant we are about all this wealth of knowledge that we have. So thank you very much for giving us what I would say is a very small taste, but a very tasty bit nonetheless. <laughs> So uh, I sincerely hope that uh, all our participants have been actively listening. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions now. You can raise your hands and we'll unmute you and uh, allow you to ask your questions. So please raise your hands and our, our uh, host here, Piyush, uh, Piyush Chief from the IKS division, will allow you to uh, ask directly. Or if you are unable to uh, speak, then please send your question on the chat box. So anyone has a question? Namdev ji, could you please ask your question? Okay, until he's asking his question, there's somebody who's asking a technical question regarding the course. Will certificate be provided? So, Vishwajanandji, would you like to answer that one? Yes, the, uh, yeah, the certificate should be provided. Uh, uh, for this batch uh, who's joined us today, there will be a test on Friday. Okay, there will be first the, the session will start with a very small lecture from me, and then we will, you know, uh, uh, roll out the test. It's a multiple choice okay. question paper. And uh, we expect at least eighty percent uh, success rate in the test. You will be given a certificate of merit, but for all participants, we will give you a participation certificate. There was also a question regarding the uh, PPTs. So, will we be able to make the PPTs available? Uh, we can do that, but I would also like to inform all the participants that uh, the ev lecture every day is also posted on Acting Media YouTube link. So, if in case you can go to the act, maybe I'll just mention it. Yes, please. Here and just... Okay. So, all our lectures are available on this YouTube. Okay, so you can go and listen to it because it comes with an explanation to every slide. But uh, the slides can be posted. We are just waiting for this batch to be over so that they can take the test and then it will be made available. We want you for in here participating with you know very active attention. Uh, there was also a question here by uh, Namdev ji. Uh, who said, ma'am, how can you use traditional knowledge for commercial application? You can use traditional knowledge for commercial uh, for use because if you are talking of even the Irish, Irish drugs, okay, so there are many drugs that are already there in the market. The only thing that we re-emphasize is take professional help whenever you are trying to market a product 
from our traditional knowledge because you know you may understand something from the text that is there but sometimes it actually helps to get a you know proper advice from a professional who's a no subject expert of that particular domain because you would be able to capture the nuances and also if in case there are certain you know, risk elements you would know how to handle the risk elements as well Uh, thank you. So there's another one by Dr. Subramanya Pandian Padia, Padianaji, who's saying, can you provide the details or any link of research work conducted on Gandhavada or Gandha Yukti? So we see this particular uh, in a presentation, we just tried to go, you know, cover the expanse of it, but uh, you can look at the Brihat Samhita because, you know, there's a lot of information that has been given on perfumery. And if in case you need any help on that, you know, you can get connected with me. I'm also putting my, uh, you know, uh, email address in the chat box. Whoever wishes to have, you know, more detailed information, I may not be able to give you now, but I will look at the details that you would be sending it to me and we will provide you answers or connect or support whichever way would you know, be the best. Okay, somebody has joined it for the second time. No, we are not making any new presentations now because we want the you know workshop to same be thing. the same for both batches so that they, you know everyone feels that they are assessed on the same level of understanding. But uh, yes. in future, we will we can make very specific subject wise uh, presentations to kind of improve upon the knowledge and talk about the IPR in that particular context. Yes. There's also another question that's coming up, a technical question regarding the certification. So I've just informed people that we are going to give certificates by the first week of September or so. Once both the batches are over, the assessments are completed, we have a consolidated results. Uh, following that, we will be sending out the certificates to those who have, uh, to everybody gets a participation and those who have qualified with merit mm -hmm. will get a merit certificate. Mm -hmm. Yes. That and, will be additional. Uh, yes. And uh, but the content is going to be the same. Both the workshops are almost identical in terms of the content. Uh, there is a question here by uh, K. Shivakumar Ji. Vishnu yeah. Chandani Ji, are you there? So I think we'll just hold a little bit. Uh, let me see if there's anything that I can or Anilji, if there's something that you can answer in the meanwhile. So there's a question regarding, can you please explain why still many people are depending on the allopathic medicines, which have many side effects, but we have many natural medicines, Ayurvedic medicines, which do not have side effects. Anilji, would you like to venture? Oh, Vishwajan Anilji, you're there. Anilji? Uh, we can wait for the madam to answer for this. I mean, this, this, for this specific question. However, there is one more question, which is like, you no, know, what is the credibility of prior arts? Because there is no clinical trials. Uh, how well the developed countries believe in the prior arts? So, with regard to the prior arts, we would like to submit that uh, uh, for getting a patent granted. These prior arts they play a very critical role because prior arts are the base. I mean, the documents or the references on which the credibility or I mean the, the, the essential parameters of granting a patent are based. So in, if you talk about novelty or inventive step, see the existence of that information as a prior art plays a very critical role. So in case it is published, your novelty goes completely, then you will not get the patent or else in case you have improved something over the existing prior, I mean the state of art, which is established through the prior arts, then you have to prove beyond the, I mean, I mean, beyond a, I mean, a normal skill that is required that you have done an inventive step on that and then only you can prove the inventive step. So prior arts definitely play a very critical role in IPRs, specifically with regard to granting of patents. Vishwajanaliji, you're back. Your video is very blurred though. There's some reason why we can't see you very clearly. There was a question. Uh, Anilji, thank you very much for that answer. 
uh, uh, there was a question here for you. Uh, by yeah, let me no, I think I'll show my video. There's some problem here. We lost power here today. Too. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. okay. You still remain the enlightened one, although it's not dark around because of the earlier <laughs> schedule. Yes. So we have uh, the K. Shivakumar ji is asking, Madam, can you please explain why till many people, still many people are depending on the allopathic medicines, which have many side effects, effects. But we have many natural medicines like Ayurveda medicines, which do not have side effects. Uh, well, uh, as per the statistics that I we received, you know, almost like 80% of uh, all countries, you know, who are the WHO member states, they use, uh, you know, the traditional medicines in some form or the other. Okay, and only when uh, I think probably the reach of the uh, modern medicine is not there, there is more reliance on the traditional medicines. Uh, perhaps it could be because of colonization and you know other related uh, matters that we have moved over to the modern medicine. But I think with all, all the recent efforts being made by the Ministry of Ayush, I, especially during COVID, we had seen that many of us have moved to traditional medicine, including Ayurveda for our everyday needs. And we are hoping that uh, this trend would continue as we move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just seeing here if there's anybody last time also. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we've got a few participants from the previous course who come here who have joined yes. again to refresh their memory. So that's also wonderful. So we have here how to clear the non obviousness step because most of the people fail to justify this criteria by Dr. Yogesh Patilji. Yeah, so I hear I would like to clarify, but that when you are applying for patent, you need to clearly understand whether that you are validating what is already known or are you developing something new? Okay, so when you are validating anything that is already known, there is nothing novel about it and there is no inventor step because we are only proving what is already known in the literature. But if in case we are doing further R&D in identifying, you know, a certain particular formulation, say, for example, I have a polyherbal formulation that is known in our ancient text, but with, you know, so it has certain kind of, you know, properties that may either relate to toxicity or, uh, uh, you know, uh, tolerability issues, but with your R&D you are able to overcome that that you need to disclose in the patent application to say that, you know, by this R&D, you have overcome that particular negative effect, okay? Then you will be able to prove that inventor's step, okay? And you will be able to, you know, at least put up your argument for a patent grant. Similarly, when you are talking about polyherbal formulation, okay? You know that it is already, in, or if you're making a polyherbal formulation from known ingredients, say in Ayurveda or Siddha, Yunani, okay? And you're making a new formulation. Typically, say for example, I have four herbs that are known for, you know, as anti-diabetes. You are just mixing all the four and saying that you have created a new formulation. You will not be able to overcome the uh, requirement of inventorship because each of the particular herb is known for that particular property. To say that, you know, in a one particular proportion, you are able to create, you know, 10x, 15x in terms of, you know, improvement in efficacy and also reduction in, say, toxicity or any other parameter. This you will be able to get only when you have done that R&D. So you will be able to prove your point of inventive step. So the next two days or three days discussions will all be on these aspects to say, it is not a blanket, uh, you know, uh, 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 discouragement on, uh, you know, filing patents on traditional knowledge. It is all about, you know, challenging you, challenging somebody to overcome, you know, the, uh, what is prior art and it, be very creative to make it useful to our current conditions, especially the unmet needs. And that is where patenting can be of help because you will be able to secure intellectual property rights on your inventions. Thank you very much. There was just, I think we'll take this last question and then stop for the day. Uh, Deepanshu Pandeji is asking, he says, first of all, he's very appreciative. In fact, there were a lot of 
comments of appreciation for the session. So uh, we have the Panshuji who's saying, I am a research scholar. Please guide me on how to apply IKS in the field of chemistry. That's a very, very broad statement. You will have to tell me which is your area of interest, because when you're talking of chemistry, you would know that there is organic chemistry, there's inorganic chemistry, there's material chemistry, there's so many different aspects. You will have to identify where, what, and then you can come back to me, and then you know we would be able to help you on that. So you can write to us, and we will get back to you. Sorry. Would you like to share your contact? I mean, the contact details where people, if they have any questions, even for today's session, they can reach out to you. Yeah, that uh, I have already done, team. but I'll put it yes, up. Yes, if again. you don't mind, yes, just yes. sharing it again for everybody. Yes. yes, so we have the details there. And uh, there is no special assignment, but Piyushi has shared the link for today's talk, the YouTube link. So please go through it. We would suggest that you look through the slides carefully and. Uh, you know, try and remember as much as possible because it will be part of the final assessment that will come your way. And uh, just one other thing is we know that there are people who are joining from the previous batch as well, but I'm sorry, the results for that remain for that session and the, those only those who are uh, new applicants for this course will be, uh, you know, their assessment will be evaluated. Their uh, exam results can... will be there. No, Anuradha, I may ha uh, differ with you on this. <laughs> let them, let them, because perhaps, you know, when uh, people are hearing IPR and people's night for the first time, it might be a kind okay. of a little difficult subject matter. If in case people are interested, let them apply. If they get a merit certificate, I think we would also be very happy that we are of, you know, use to somebody. Yes, because the good news is it's not relative grading. So it's not that we have a limited number of people who can clear the merit thing. So as many clear, the better it is. Yes. So please feel free to share it with your uh, the pre previous group also and say there's a second chance. Yes. <laughs> so we will have everybody listening all over again. But it would definitely benefit you to uh, you know go through the content more carefully once more. So thank you very much. I think we'll stop here for the day and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you tomorrow, same time from 4 to 5. Huge tomorrow, 4 to 5. Yes, so we will hold it from four. We'll have it from four to five again for the whole week uh, and uh, look forward to your active participation. So I'll just end. Very like, typically, we tend to close with a recitation and we'll end the session with the Shanti Mantra. So. Oh, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Niramaya. Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschit Dukha Bhaghavet Shanti 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 Thank you very much and Punar Milama. See you tomorrow. See you. Namaste to everyone.